Um, I was born in Berlin, a very bad idea in 1922, because uh, the Nazis were in charge of the streets already. It's 11 years before Hitler took over. And uh, <clears throat> being therefore the son of a lawyer and uh, my mother a physiotherapist, I was sort of expected to become a lawyer. And uh, that would have happened, except that I had to flee uh, from Vienna when, uh, in December 38, after the so-called Kristallnacht, the big pogrom. And by luck, I got uh, to England on what's called the Kindertransport. Like 10,000 children were brought to England from Nazi Europe. And uh, uh, there, I lucked into being allowed to take a course on uh, electrical engineering. And uh, that was very boring, except for the physics part. The physics was very nice. And so, as a 18-year-old, so to speak, I decided to pursue that. And uh, by luck, uh, in America, I, where I went to a college, there was a very good physicist who, in a way, uh, adopted me. That is, uh, he allowed me to be his research assistant. And that uh, made it certain that I'm going to follow that, uh, no matter what. Although it was not obvious that I could uh, achieve anything very important in the long run. But to many scientists and others, just go on this unexplored path out of their passion. And so I ended up uh, getting my PhD at Harvard. Uh, 1940s, anybody who knew a little physics was asked to come to Los Alamos and help develop the bomb because the Germans were actually ahead by a good beat in doing research before even the Americans started. The Germans started in the week after they started the war, in September 1939. The Americans and the Brits didn't get around to it for a long time. So <clears throat> this was a very important kind of thing to do. And uh, so I was being recruited to go to Los Alamos. It wasn't called that way, some code name was. And I found out through indirection what they were doing there. And it seemed to me that uh, it is a very aggressive kind of a, uh, research, which was needed at the time. I have no doubt about that, because the Germans could have been ahead of us. But I had been brought to England from Nazi to Europe by the Quakers, who took nice care of me and even of my parents in England. And so we were rescued by them, and I became very fond of their way of spirituality. And uh, so for that reason, I said, uh, I do not want to be a part of an aggressive, I want to be part of a defensive research. And that's why at Harvard, I, worked, I stayed on in their laboratory working on, for example, being a teaching fellow for radar and uh, on electroacoustics. And those two things were very much more in the sync with my particular feeling of uh, spirituality at that time. In my high school period, in the gymnasium in Vienna, uh, you had to, and it wasn't pleasant at all, you had to go very seriously to everything from mathematics to poetry, from biology to history and so on, because it was in a way a college, not a high school. It was preparing you for the university, for getting your PhD, your, your doctor's degree. And so it was very uh, important for me to get the idea of a continuity of culture across this whole field, from poetry to mathematics, for example. So uh, when I then uh, 
got my degree, my position at Harvard and had to teach physics, I thought I'd write a book for the, my class. And in this book, unlike any other physics book at the time, it was very courageous and maybe stupid to do it, uh, I also put in the history of science, the technology, and uh, the other sciences, not just physics, but chemistry and astronomy as well, and a little bit of biology. So that they see that science is part of a tapestry. It is not all there by itself hanging down. It is woven into a culture. This I was much appreciated by my students, and so I was giving lectures both in physics and in history of science, and in each case I snuggled in the other. So in the physics there was the history of science, and in the history of science there was physical science as well. Since Einstein, there has been nobody with his qualities. Because the qualities to be an Einstein are not only in doing this fantastic work in science. He also was a civilizer. That the, the idea of unification, for example, to him went far beyond physics. It was necessary for people to become enchanted with the idea of one world. Mm -hmm. instead of various nations. He was a democrat, not only in inertial systems, all of which are equal, <laughs> but also among humans. Uh, but uh, he made sure that he would be prominent in his announcement to say, say, all human beings are created equal. And to him, this unification of humanity is part of his way of thinking about everything. So it is the the kind of thing that I don't see nowadays in our scientists, although great science is being done, but what is missing is the uh, devotion to the cultural context, because we have become more and more uh, limited in our research to just what is going on now, here, because we better do it fast here at Harvard, because maybe at Stanford they are ahead of us. Yeah. So there's not much time for One World or for Kant or for Mach or any of those people. Along with, with a Galileo, whom he admired, or Newton, you know, uh, or Maxwell, he regarded himself as doing a Maxwell, a type of work that Maxwell would do. And he had a picture of Newton and Maxwell and Faraday in his house the only three big pictures of, of scientists. So he adored them, and uh, uh, he knew that he was really following in their trail. Mm -hmm. And so we can say he is of that area uh, of, uh, of developing thinking, which g gets that high, uh, that it shows how high humanity can go mm -hmm. in its imagination. But there are still people, and particularly in the U.S. and in the Congress, who don't believe in evolution or in global warming, because they say, and this now comes from another area of conflict, namely many of them are evangelical people, they believe that between facts and faith, you have to choose faith and dismiss facts, or is. Uh, Many say, science is merely mechanical. It is not spiritual. Therefore, anything that comes out of science cannot be accepted by those who wish to be mostly spiritual. This is a mistake to make, but they are stuck with that mistake, and we are stuck with their mistake. So uh, this cannot be solved in an, any easy way, uh, not even just through uh, advances in education, we have to wait for a change of the, the flow of history, zeitgeist, so to speak. And that happens very slowly. The Women in Science uh, book, which is called Gender Difference, <clears throat> we discovered, of course, m many great scientists are there amongst, uh, among the women and many who did not quite make it. But uh, on average, what we found was 
that a woman is more likely, for example, if she's a member of a group of children uh, and uh, there is not enough money for all of them to go to college, it was very likely that the family in those days, back in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, they would give that money to make a boy into college rather than the girl. Uh, that has changed, but uh, that was responsible for the first of the small differences, that it was more difficult for a girl to get the education. Then, <clears throat> once they are in a scientific field and uh, study science, they discovered that, uh, and this to some degree is still true, that if you are a newcomer, you may, may be the uh, only or only two or three uh, girls in a class, that uh, when the boys go out for a football match, they don't take the girls along. Later on, when the boys from the laboratory go out to have some beer, they are not likely to say, come along. We are not so likely to say then, in those years, uh, come along. So the girl was left out from the talk among them, which very often is about some research problems, and that is important in that way, and career forming as well. So this is the type, the, the tiny little accumulation, the accumulation of tiny little things that happen, any one of which would not be terrible, but the many of them coming together. And then we did a research which I think uh, sort of clinches it. We then <clears throat> took um, a group of uh, men and women and asked them to submit what they regarded as their best work and uh, take away the names so that they wouldn't be identified and submitted these to a group of distinguished scientists to give the quality. And it turned out that on average, what the women were working on was as good or better than what the men were working on. And it had an additional thing, namely that women tended to look for really difficult problems and worked on them for a long time, whereas the men used to look for solvable problems and had many uh, uh, publications out of it while the woman still was working on it, on that one thing which is so important. So to the men it's more of a career in science, and to the women it was more a calling in science. Now that's a big difference, and uh, shows up in, in, their, in their job performance.